Here we go. You ready to get in the word? Amen. Genesis chapter 1, we are starting in a new series. And it, it's exciting coming off a week of fresh wind. Pastor Austin mentioned how, how great of a week, and I would concur. But we had some incredible times around the altar, exciting to see what God is doing. And I believe that there are exciting days ahead of us. How many of you would agree with that? How many of you would believe or say that our best days are yet to come? Do you have that kind of an outlook on life? I am excited this morning as we start this new series in the book of Genesis, the beginnings. This is a, this is a kind of a new beginning for us. We, two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, we opened uh, the uh, north wing of our building with uh, incredible facilities for our elementary. If you haven't had a chance to go through that, we have state-of-the-art, probably the best facilities for elementary students in the state of Iowa of any church, and I believe that um, we have, inc- I mean, there's an incredible uh, opportunity for us to reach a lot of people. We have a chapel that seats four, 500, the same one that we're going to be having the Season Saints banquet in on Tuesday night, but right now there's a service that's happening there. Pastor Zach is preaching in that service this morning, uh, a message that we work together to collaborate. He's going to preach it his way. I'm preaching it my way. Mine is better, so you chose the right place to be today. So... There you go. I'm older, so I can say that. And I'm his dad, so I can say that. So I'm sure we'll get back to him. Just two weeks we've been doing this. Last week we had fresh wind and we had Pastor Choco de Jesus here and we had to stream him there. And I think people found out, hey, we love having a a live preacher. So, you know, as long as we can, two of us be preaching in the same place, that's what we're going to do. But whether you choose that service with more contemporary worship or you're right here where... um, where you are right now, you are in for a treat. And this, this series, typically we preach in series, and we often, in that rotation, will include a book of the Bible. I think it's important for us to go systematically through books of the Bible. And so today we are beginning with the first book, Genesis, which is about beginnings and origins. We are in this new uh, season, and uh, so it's very appropriate that we're looking at Genesis. Genesis was written by... Moses, I heard that. That's great. Obviously, Moses wasn't there at the beginning. Moses wasn't at creation, but God gave Moses a revelation, inspiration from the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is inspired by God. It is God-breathed, meaning that God divinely influenced the human authors of scriptures in such a way that what they wrote is the word of God. God used them through their personality, but gave them the things to write. And we believe that the Bible truly is the word of God. Of all books, it is unique. And there's a growing belief in Christianity that Genesis in much of the Old Testament is simply allegory. It's just a story that teaches a lesson, but we believe that Genesis is actually a recording of literal history. That God actually did create, that Adam and Eve actually lived on the earth, that they, they were placed in the Garden of Eden, that Noah was here, Noah built an ark, and there was a flood that destroyed the whole earth, except he and his family that were on that ark. About Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph were actually men who lived here on earth. That is our stand on the book of Genesis. So here we go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You know this. You probably have it put to memory, right? In the beginning. In the beginning, God. Before there was anything, there was God. God is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. He has no beginning and he has no end. God is totally self-sufficient. He needs nothing other than himself to exist. It's important for us to know and understand that God needs nothing. He simply is. God is. In the beginning, God. He doesn't need the material universe or anything else to survive. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need any human being. Yet we see that he created and he created everything. A.W. Tozer said this, God has a voluntary relation to everything that he has made. 
He has a voluntary relation to everything that he has made. He has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself. He doesn't need anyone. His relation to us is voluntary, yet we see that he chose us. He created us and he chose us. Ephesians 1.4 says that even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ. So thankful for that. He didn't need to, but he did it. In the beginning, God. Moses doesn't try to explain God. He doesn't explore God. He doesn't even talk about him. He just announces God. In the beginning, God. It was just him before anything else. God. We made that point. God is self-sufficient. He was in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What did he do? What did God do? He created. He is the creator, the author of life. He's the explanation of everything that we see around us. In God, he has everything. We know, we've been around long enough to know that everybody does not believe this. In our culture, there is growing uh, interest in understanding the origins, and people have gone to great lengths to try to explain and understand the origin of, of the world that we live in. There are a lot of theories. Hard for people to believe that there is God. Hard for people to believe that God spoke, that God created. One theory that we're familiar with is called the Big Bang Theory. You're familiar with that? When I was in high school, so this would have been 1982, in biology class, my biology teacher said, hey, I'm required to teach different theories. She said, but I don't believe, I don't believe anything but creation. That's me. I'm required to teach this unless any of you has an objection. I'm just gonna teach creation. Nobody objected. That's my experience. I don't think those teachers exist in public education today, but it's okay for us to learn about theories, but understand it's a theory. It is simply a theory, the Big Bang Theory, through the Hubble telescope, which was launched in 1990 by NASA. They have discovered that there are more galaxies than just this galaxy that we live in, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. They actually think that there is potentially 100 million galaxies, 100 billion galaxies. Some say that there are two trillion galaxies. And so what they've observed looking out through the telescope that is in space, looking through space, that everything is, is moving away. It's moving farther and farther from each other. And from this, they formed this theory, gave this theory some more re relevance to them, that if we are constantly getting bigger, then at one point the universe was very, very small. What they say is 13.8 billion years ago. I wonder, how do we get to the point of 13.8 billion? You ever just wondered how, how much a billion is? Turn it into seconds. How many seconds, or how, how long is a thousand seconds? In your head, 16 and a half minutes. A million seconds. Do you know how, many, how much time a million seconds is? It's 11 days and 13 hours. A billion seconds is 31 and a half years. 13.8 billion seconds is 435 years. That's how much 13, here's the thing. We have written history for about a few thousand years and they're talking about 13.8. Why is it not 13.7? How did they arrive at 13.8? I just want to say, I'd, I don't know who was there watching all this. It's all speculation. But here we are. They know that it was 13.8 billion years ago. And they're confident about this, that there was a tiny, dense fireball that exploded. Listen to what National Geographic says. It's thought that, which means that it's a theory. It's thought that the early universe contained equal amounts of matter and antimatter. But as the universe cooled, photons no longer packed enough punch to make matter-antimatter pairs. So like an extreme game of musical chairs, many particles of matter and antimatter paired off and annihilated one another. 
somehow some excess matter survived. And it's now the stuff that people, planets, and galaxies are made of. We're the leftovers that survived that battle. Physicists are still trying to figure out, listen, they're still trying to figure out exactly how matter won out in the universe. So how was the universe first created? A tiny fireball of dense gas. That's mysterious, if you ask me. What caused the Big Bang? It's a mystery. How is it that we won out? We don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. It's a mystery. There's another theory called core accretion theory. Again, in National Geographic. And then this, you can pick to choose whatever level you want to read it at. So I'm going to read for you this morning the third grade level of the core accretion theory. Today, there are eight planets orbiting the sun. The planets in the sun make up our solar system. The planets formed a very long time ago in a cloud of gas and dust. The cloud is called a solar nebula. The cloud was spinning. A clump formed in the center, and it was very hot. The clump formed the sun, the star at the center of our solar system. It happened 4.6 billion years ago. The rest of our solar system formed a little later, so a little less than 4.6 billion years ago. After the sun had formed, there was some gas and dust left over, and it came together in smaller clumps. The cloud was still spinning, and the clumps of matter crashed into each other. They stuck together. Some of the clumps grew into planets, including Earth. Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago in three different stages. They know it was three stages. The first stage was when clumps of gas, dust, rock, and ice came together and formed a planet. That is called accretion. Then shortly after Earth formed, a tiny planet crashed into it. We don't know its name. This might be, this might be how the moon formed. In the last stage, many asteroids hit Earth. They held a lot of water. Some of that water stayed on Earth. Later, a blanket of gas formed around the planet. That's called an atmosphere. Early atmosphere was made up of simple gases. There was no oxygen yet. As the planet changed, volcanoes erupted. These volcanoes gave off other gases like water and carbon dioxide. Slowly, the oceans began to take shape. And then early life evolved in those oceans. And as you read further, evolution, this theory says that humans can trace our ancestry back to fish. Listen, we, you laugh at this. This is what is being taught to our kids. Are they learning about creation in school? No. Not even as a theory. But here's what it says in Genesis. Because you can find all different kinds of information out there about how the universe began, but they're simply theories. They're only theories. Listen, this is not a theory. We believe this is the word of God. It is truth. It is the very words of God that give us life. What Genesis says is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And as you continue reading through Genesis 1, day 1, he created light, and he saw that it was good. Day 2, he separated the waters of the earth from the waters of the heaven, and he called it the sky. Day two, he saw that the sky was good. Day three, he gathered the waters of the earth together and named it sea, the dry land that was left over. He called it land, and that was the third day, and he called all of his creation good. On day four, he made two great lights, the larger one to rule the day, called the sun, the smaller one to rule the night, the moon, and all the stars that are in the universe. And so some of you at this point are thinking, wait a minute, didn't God create light on day one? Now he's creating the sun three days later. How does that work? I want to read to you a parallel passage of scripture in the book of John chapter 1 that sounds very similar to Genesis chapter 1. It starts out, in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light on day one, 
I believe, came from God himself. He is the light of the world. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? Revelation 22, 5, the last chapter of the book says this about heaven, and there will be no more night there. No need for lamps or the sun, for the Lord will shine on them. He is the light. Life as we know it would not exist on earth without the sun. The S-U-N or the S-O-N, the Son of God. Light cannot be associated with darkness. They have nothing in common. And then the scripture tells us that we as God's people, we walk in the light. Reading on in Genesis chapter one, God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So from the very first day of creation, God established a principle and it was a principle of separation. He separated light from darkness. He separated the sky, the waters of the, of the, of the heavens and the waters of the earth. He separated land and sea. Excuse me. I'm talking too fast. <clears throat> he separated day and night. So we... We need separation. Separation is a biblical principle. To be holy is to be separate, to be set apart. To say that God is holy means that he is unlike us. He is unique to himself. God is in a category all his own. He is holy. For us to be holy, the Bible says that we are to be set apart to him. To set, be set apart from sin, to be set apart from the world, and to be set apart to God. We walk in the light. We don't associate with darkness. This doesn't mean that we don't associate with people of the darkness or we don't go to those places. The Lord tells us that we are to take the light into the world. We are in the world, we're not of the world. And it's time for us to stop playing games and bringing darkness into our lives, bringing darkness into our homes. It shouldn't be there. We need to strive to live holy lives. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. We're talking about light. So he tells us, shine, shine where I've placed you. Let the light of Jesus shine through you. We are like the moon. The moon doesn't have a light source. The moon reflects the light of the sun. And we are to reflect him. And he says, listen, I've placed you on a hilltop. I've put you there so that you will shine. So shine so everybody can see. It's time to get out of our place of comfort and to go to those dark places where the sun, where the light can shine. We're commissioned to go and to make disciples. Let's get back to creation. Sorry, a little bit of a caveat there. Day five, he created the fish in the seas, the birds in the air, he saw that it was good. Day six, he created the animals on the land and humans. And he looked at his creation of mankind and he said, he is very good. We're gonna break down that part of scripture next week. But I want you to know that you, of all God's creation, were created in his image. And you've heard this all of your life if you've, followed, if you've been in church. But when God sees you, he says, very good. It's very good. On day seven, God rested from his labor. And I think it's pretty amazing that Adam's first day on earth was a day of rest. Before God created, there was nothing. The earth was formless. It was empty. It was void. It was barren. It was desolate. The living Bible says it was a shapeless, chaotic mess. The message version says, earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. Simply put, there was, there was nothing. And God brings something out of nothing. He brings order out of chaos. He brings fullness from emptiness. And I believe that if God could do that in creation, what can he do for you? That is a good question for us to ask this morning. What can he do for you? Can he do that now? Yes, he can. 
He's the God of order. There's nothing that he can't do. There was nothing. There was empty. There was void. There was just God in the beginning. In the beginning, God. But he spoke and he said, let there be light. And there was light. He didn't say, let there be light like a question like, let me out of this room or let me have a cookie. It wasn't a question. It really literally is translated, light exists when he said, let there be light. From nothing, something. Only God can do that. The Latin uh, word for that is ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Who else has ever done this in history? Creating something from nothing. Can we point our finger to any one person who has done this very thing in creation? We see a lot of creative things happening Uh, But everything that we see that is being created or that is being um, invented is using something from something else. We've seen some incredible art, but an artist, uh, even though they've made some incredible things, they started with a canvas, they started with paint, they started with, with a brush. A sculptor has tools, he had a hammer a chisel, so he had to have a stone. Everybody starts with raw materials, but God speaks and from nothing creates something. For a lot of people, that is really, really hard to believe. There are people who are laughing at that just as much as you laughed at other theories. But do you believe this morning, do you have faith to believe this morning that God created, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Do you believe that this morning? Some may say, I just don't have enough faith for that. And I honestly believe it takes faith. But what are you gonna believe? What are you choosing to believe? Every other theory takes faith. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I have have the faith to believe that a tiny fireball in nothing just all of a sudden happened And it evolved into what we have today. That dust was spinning so fast that all of a sudden, here's people. I'm not sure that I have enough faith to connect you back to a fish. That takes a lot of faith. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, and that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So what I can believe And what I do believe is that there is something. There is someone who is bigger than me. I look around at things. And I think as I look at creation, there has to be a design here. There has to be a designer. This all didn't just happen by chance and that everything is getting better. Because what I see in the world is that everything seems to be getting worse, not better. It didn't all happen by chance. It screams to me as I look at creation and the world around me that there is a purpose in what I see and there is purpose in the things that I can't see. There's a reason behind it. And I choose to have faith to believe that in the beginning, God created. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 33, starting in verse six. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea to its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. The whole world, let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began and it appeared at his command. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I've got enough faith to believe that. As Choka would say, that's a good place to say amen. Amen. If we can have faith to believe that God spoke and out of nothing created something, if God can do that, how basic are my needs? If God can speak the worlds and the universe into existence with a word, how big are my needs to him? How easy would it be for God to meet a need in our life? He spoke. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God has spoken throughout Scripture, throughout history. He's communicated through dreams. He's communicated through visions, through through a bush, a burning bush. He spoke through a donkey. One of the most incredible 
moments in Scripture, I think, when God spoke was in a whirlwind in the book of Job. As the Iowans, we call that a tornado. If you don't know the story of Job, take time to read it. Scripture tells us that Job was a blameless, upright person, a man of complete integrity. Job had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and many servants. He was the wealthiest man in his area. And Satan comes to God and says, if you take everything away, Job will curse you to your face. And God allows Job to be tested. And in one day, Job loses everything he owns. His livestock, his employees, all of his buildings, even his children. Everything gone in a day. And then he's afflicted with a horrible disease. His wife tells him to curse God. He's got three friends that dialogue with him. And they say, Job, I don't know, but you must have done something wrong. You've sinned against God. And for the next 37 chapters of Job, Job refuses to curse God. But he asks a lot of questions. Things that we all ask, a lot of speculation and consternation about, why has this happened to me? You ever ask that question? Why me? Job tries to plead his case before God. What did I do to deserve this? He sought to have his day in court with God to argue his innocence before him. And a lot of questions for things that he just didn't understand. But in chapter 38 of Job, God shows up and he speaks through a whirlwind. He speaks through a tornado and he asks a number of questions of Job. And the point of the questions is to show perspective. Of all things, God refers Job back to creation. The fact that he made something from nothing and directs everything. And this is what he says to Job after Job spends most of the book complaining, asking questions, trying to understand, trying to figure out why. This is what God says to him. The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. And this is what he says. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Everybody right here. Where were you when you laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone? Verse 12. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you ever made daylight spread to the ends of the earth? Verse 31, can you direct the movement of the stars? Can you direct the sequence of the seasons? Do you know how, do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct? What he's saying is, Job, you don't know enough to understand the mystery of natural things. How can you really understand eternal things? Job, your perspective on the world is puny. Your perspective on the world is so small, but mine is huge. Things are so much more complicated than you even think they are. Listen, Job, trust me. Listen, God created, and he created mankind. That's us. At the end of his creation, out of all creation, he said, this is very good. He chose us. He chose to love us. And as we read in Scripture, we understand more about God. We see this, that God's power is supreme. Two weeks ago, I shared this Scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God can do anything, you know, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. God's perspective is infinite. Isaiah 55 says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are so much higher than your ways. God's purpose is guaranteed. What the enemy intends for evil, God will always work it for good. God's promises are eternal. His presence is assured. And his presence makes all the difference. God's presence makes all the difference. He has given himself to us. Job responds back to God at the end of the book, chapter 42. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. 
You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It's I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I take everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. As we make God way too small. If God can speak and create the universe with a word, then certainly he can meet us right where we are. Certainly he knows what you need. He's not upset that you are questioning, but he's going to ask you some questions. And it's not like he's on a power trip trying to tell you who you are and you're nothing and that he's somebody. He's saying, listen to me. I chose you. You're mine. You belong to me. Stop worrying about the things that you don't know anything about. And trust me. Trust me. We have a God who is creator, who's spoken out of nothing, made something. He made everything. Do you think you can trust him today? We have to have faith. Faith that God did create. That he did create something out of nothing. Faith that God will continue to do that for me. Faith that God uh, can take the chaos of our lives and make order out of it. I don't know what chaos you're facing today. I don't know what darkness you feel like you're walking in today. But listen, the chaos is all from the enemy. All he does is steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. But God has come that we might have life Life and light in the darkness and emptiness. And what I read here that in the beginning was God. From the beginning. And what I know is that he never changes. Forever he is who he was. And forever he will be. And he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you need God today? Would you stand with me today? If God has spoken to you something, and I believe that he is speaking all across the room to those who are joining online today, if God is speaking into you, and he's speaking to the very thing in your life that you have questions about, the very thing that you're going, I don't understand, and it's causing you to doubt, it's causing you not to trust, it's causing you not to believe. Listen, it takes faith, but there is no other theory If you want to call it a theory, this rises above to everything. It gives reason to everything that we see in the universe. You're not just an accident or a bunch of dust that's spinning and getting hot and crashing with each other and all of a sudden forms something. I don't believe that for a minute. God created and he created you and there is purpose and there is a plan. I believe that. Do you? How many of you today, God has spoken to you? We're going to pray. If you have a need this morning, we're going to end with prayers. The worship team leads us in prayer. We're going to pray for needs, and God's going to meet us right here. Today, if you're far from God, you're not walking with him. You're in darkness, and you need light. Come here. Find Jesus. He is the light. Let him shine on you. Let him fill you. Let him change you. Whatever circumstances that you're facing that seem so dark and impossible, meet God right here. I believe that things happen in the presence of God. His presence makes all the difference. It was his presence and creation that made the difference. And I believe that he wants to meet you here. We're going to pray. Those that can pray with people, I want you to come. And let's join together with those who respond this morning. And we're going to pray and believe God to do miraculous things. If he can speak the world into existence, he can meet your need this morning. If you have a need this morning, come. Oftentimes in our lives, we can find ourselves in a similar position to Job. If you've not read Job's story, I encourage you. Probably not a better book for us as humans to identify with can't understand everything being taken away but sometimes it feels that way it just takes a thing something in your life that begins to crumble and fall apart and it feels like everything is imploding everything's coming down 
stepping out of where God wants you to be and all of a sudden you realize I'm on some shaky ground. God's drawing us back to himself. And I believe that God can speak into your life, into your marriage, into your family, to your children, into your whatever circumstance it is. He's the God of order. He takes chaos and turns it into order. He takes nothing and turns it into something. And he can do that miraculously in a moment. He can do it through a process. But it takes us coming to him by faith and saying, God, I believe that you can. And I believe that you will. I believe in you, Jesus. Continually, continually coming back to him. I believe that when we put ourselves in that place and we see God for who he is, that he is that big, but yet he's very near. He came as one of his creation, stepped into what he created in order to save us and redeem us. You can't get much closer than dying for your friend. And that's what he's done for you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if there's anyone in the room and you are not in a relationship with Jesus, you're not walking in relationship. You want and need and know that you need forgiven. You need to know that your sins have been washed away. That's what Jesus does. And he can change your life. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, pray for me. I see one hand in the others. Looking across the room, just raise your hand and keep it raised. Thank you. Father, today I pray for every person that has raised a hand, every person joining online, whether they are walking uh, near you, but they're just not walking in relationship with you. I pray that they would give themselves completely and fully to you, put their faith in you, the one who created, who designed, who loves them so much. You gave yourself for us. You died in our place. You took our sin upon yourself. We receive that love and that forgiveness and that grace and mercy that you extend as a free gift. And we say, Jesus, save me, forgive me, change me. Send your mighty name that thanking you, God, for your goodness to us. Amen. 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 Let's not forget that God does miracles. Out of nothing, something. If you don't hear anything else today, that's going to come up to you sometime this week, and you're going to be turned to faith in Him, saying, I know that you can make something out of nothing work in my life. Amen. Find a good class. There are a lot of Sunday school classes. A lot. Get a brochure. If you've not been in a class, there are a lot. God bless you. Be back tonight. Tonight we'll have a special time in the presence of God.